in the United States in the tracks, the signals, the equipment to be able to revitalize a vital system of transportation, taking pressure off of airports and roads. But as I say, uh, the choice is whether or not we're going to build it, we're going to own it, and it will accrue to the benefit of the American public. Well, you, you're right on an issue that is very close to my own policies, which is if it's American taxpayer money that's being used to buy a bus, a light rail car, a street car, or a locomotive, or a train set for BART in California, or the metro system here in Washington, D.C., then our money must be used to buy American-made equipment. Plain and simple, those are American jobs. We had a terrible uh, example of bad policy in California, the uh, San Francisco uh, Bay Bridge, uh, Oakland-San Francisco Bay Bridge, a multi-billion dollar project. The steel in that bridge went out to bid. It's a uh, billion dollars or so of steel for the bridge. One contractor put in two bids. One bid was 10 percent cheaper, and that was Chinese steel. The other bid was American steel, and it was 10 percent more. So the bridge authority, in its wisdom, selected the cheaper. Turns out that cheaper is not necessarily better and ultimately not cheap it. It turned out that it was far more expensive. There were serious flaws in the steel, in the welding, and six to 8,000 jobs were in China rather than in the United States. Ultimately, the cost was higher, and we did not benefit in the United States, even in California, from the increased economic activity that would have occurred if the direct jobs in manufacturing and welding and fabricating that steel were in the United States. We don't want that ever again. If it's our taxpayer money from whatever source, then make it in America. Use our money to buy domestic-made buses and trains and steel. We've got work to do. I put this one up here not to get away from the transit systems and the public transportation systems, which are critically important, but we've got 150,000 miles of road that need repair. The transportation bill that had been offered by our colleagues on the Republican side doesn't even get close to keeping up with what we need in the highway system and repairing the bridges that are falling down or could fall down across America. We have work to do. We need to reignite the American dream, and part of that dream has been the world's best transportation system. Unfortunately, over the last decade or two, we have seen that decline in the American status in transportation. Whether we're in the third world or the second world, we're surely not in the first world for highway transportation or for the public transportation system. We have work to do to reignite the American dream, and this transportation bill that ultimately we must pass, the Senate and the House, we must come together and pass a bill that is adequately funded, that provides for public transportation as well as for the road transportation. Our Republican colleagues are not even close to that. They've got a $75 billion hole in their wallet, not filled by the programs that have been put forward. I know that you've been serving on this committee. You're far more familiar than I am with it. So let's just continue with well, this for a little while. Well, but this, you, one of your points about the impact of uh, that one piece of the bridge project, the $400 uh, million dollar, uh, element of steel, it wasn't just the steel itself. Had we been developing uh, that portion of the steel for the project in the United States, there would have been thousands of other jobs that would have been related to it to support that effort in terms of the manufacturing, the development, the people who, pr who provide the equipment to manufacture the steel and put it in place, and the tools. Uh, uh, it is a dramatic ripple effect. Um, you referenced 15, 100, excuse me, 150,000 miles of road in critical need of repair. Uh, what's under the surface is even in worse shape. We have in the United States every day six billion gallons of water that leaks from water mains uh, that are old, in some cases unsafe and unhealthy. Uh, that's the equivalent of nine 
thousand Olympic-sized swimming pools. Lined end to end, it would go from Washington, D.C. to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's a lot of swimming. It's a lot of water that's wasted. It is a problem in terms of undermining roads. We've all seen these, these terrible pictures of sinkholes that developed. I used to keep them uh, and use them for presentations. I stopped when one of the sinkholes was actually in my old neighborhood of Portland, Oregon, that opened up in the middle of the street, swallowed a maintenance truck. Um, this is serious business. The American Society of Civil Engineers, every five years, does a report card on the state of American infrastructure. And their most recent report card showed that we have $2.3 billion, trillion dollars, trillion. excuse me, $2.3 trillion unmet need, and the grades ranged from C- minus to an F in terms of water, the electrical grid, transit, roads, bridges. This is serious business in terms of American quality of life. And think about the hundreds of thousands of family wage jobs if we were investing in rebuilding and renewing America. And I know you uh, appear to have a little statistic here. I, I would like to have handed this to you as you were talking about the uh, uh, expansion that occurs when you invest in infrastructure. Uh, and so I ran over to get this, but I didn't want to interrupt your, your discussion. For every dollar invested in infrastructure investments, a dollar and 57 cents is pumped into the American economy. That's the multiplier effect that occurs when you invest in this. And these are investments that pay dividends year after year. This is the immediate turnaround, and you described it so very well. It's the small business that's fabricating. It's the steel mill, and on and on. A dollar and fifty cents. So we invest a dollar today. We get a dollar and fifty cents back in economic activity. People paying taxes. So we recoup much of this dollar investment. Uh, so this is uh, just the, the immediate multiplier effect. But an investment, let's say. Um, a water system in Portland, Oregon that is old and needs to be replaced, that's now in the ground and it's going to serve year one, two, three, and probably for the next century. So it's not something that is used up. I, I suppose if we were to invest in a, uh, an artillery shell and we shoot it off in Afghanistan, well, okay, that's a one-off, one time, and it's gone. That's, that's, Perhaps to good purpose, but gone. You invest in infrastructure in America, you get an immediate return, and it's there for the next generation and the generation beyond. It's a very important point. Uh, the same uh, said Society of, um, uh, of American Civil Engineers has produced another fascinating report about what the cost will be if we don't invest in the water infrastructure. And they have documented tens of billions of dollars of extra cost if we do not take care of these problems. It is not a, a problem that is unknown to American homeowners who quickly find out that if you don't fix the hole in the roof, you end up with massive structural well, damage. Excuse me, you're getting too close to my roof. Move on. Don't, don't, don't focus on <laughs> roofs, because I didn't fix it, and yes, I got to repair the inside as well as the roof. Well, what the damage that you mentioned earlier in terms of the roads that are in need of critical repair, the cost to the American motorists in terms of uh, the damage to car suspension systems and tires, the wear and tear wears out cars more rapidly. Delays in traffic for something like UPS, uh, a five minute delay I think uh, translates to something like a hundred million dollars of cost to them over the course of a year. And this dollar and 57 cents of economic impact for every dollar invested translates into over 25,000 jobs for each billion dollars 
that is spent on infrastructure. A far greater rate of return uh, than on military spending, uh, on a lot of the other things, uh, tax cuts, uh, for heaven's sakes. Uh, this is real economic benefit, and particularly when we've got a, a building trades uh, sector where unions are looking at uh, 20, 30, 40 percent or more unemployment. Uh, these are opportunities to put people to work tomorrow on things that people in America need today. Uh, we ought not dance around one of the issues involved in this infrastructure. That's where's the money coming from? How are you going to pay for this stuff? Uh, the Democrats, uh, our colleague Rosa DeLauro, for more than 15 years has made a proposal here in this House that we create what Europe has had for the last almost 30 years now, an infrastructure bank, a way to finance those projects that have a cash flow, the specific ones that you're talking about. The bridge has a toll, has the ability to pay off a loan. The water system has a fee associated with the delivery of water, the sanitation system. All of those are what I call cash flow projects. Uh, wrote Ms. Uh, DeLauro from Connecticut has proposed an infrastructure bank in which the federal government provides the initial capital, say a 10-year note. We can borrow at the federal level for less than 2% now on a 10-year note. Put that in the bank, go to the pension funds around the nation, and they all uh, invest in the bank. And now we may have 25, 30, 50 billion dollars, and in some cases, depending on how robust you want to go, you could have 100 billion dollars of capital available in the infrastructure bank to finance the kinds of projects that have a cash flow associated with toll roads, water systems, sanitation systems, airports. Um, bridges that have a toll of associated with it. All of those things are possible, and in doing that, you not only create the opportunity to finance those projects and obtain this kind of economic stimulation, but you also have taken off of the general fund of the federal government and some state and local governments, taken off of their general fund the burden of financing those, freeing up money for those infrastructure projects that do not have a cash flow associated with them. For example, many of the highways and byways and county roads throughout America where there's no fee associated with it. So we have the opportunity to finance these things. If we could just get off the dime, please, please the leadership in this House, move us forward. Give us a project that we can actually put in place, an infrastructure bank, and other kinds of projects would actually create jobs. The, the gentleman is absolutely correct. Um, <clears throat> now, there are lots of ways of going about this. You know, Ronald Reagan, who, in 1982, understood that the gas tax, a user fee, uh, could be used to, ha to help the country at that point, which was in a serious uh, economic recession. Ronald Reagan signed into law a nickel a gallon increase in the gas tax um, that helped spur economic development activity. We have right now uh, unnecessary, if you don't want to raise a tax, there are unnecessary uh, tax benefits that are flowing, for instance, to the largest oil companies um, that no longer need these tax breaks. In fact, George Bush um, the Younger uh, famously was... George W. Bush. Uh, George W. The Bush. most recent Bush. Uh, was famously quoted as when oil prices got to $50 a barrel, oil companies didn't need incentives to drill for the most profitable commodity on the face of the planet. Well, we've watched it go $100 a barrel or more. Um, we could completely capitalize the infrastructure bank the gentleman talked about just by unnecessary tax benefits to oil companies, which the majority of the American public would approve in a heartbeat. There's also uh, just uh, the expiring tax provisions on the wealthiest of Americans would just half of that, half of that, would enable us to fully fund the transportation 
uh, gap over the next 10 years. Over the next 10 years. I have bipartisan legislation that would deal with an, a water trust fund that would leverage close to a trillion dollars because of what the gentleman said, that there are other funds flowing for infrastructure like that. A trillion dollars of development over the next 20 years. There are opportunities here for us to step up and meet the needs of America to rebuild and renew it. Well, we have work to do, and Americans want to go to work, and they want things made in America. I was uh, interested in, in what you were saying about uh, the use of, uh, of our tax code. The big five oil companies in America, Exxon, Chevron, BP, uh, and the other two have, in the last decade, a trillion dollars of profit a trillion dollars of profit for those, yet at the same time, those big five get four billion dollars a year in tax subsidies, our tax money going to those companies as if they don't have enough of our money already. But they do. If we re dial that back and bring that back into the system for infrastructure investment, you could use it, as, as you say, for transportation because it's associated with transportation. You could use it for clean energy. You could use it to capitalize. Let's say you take three years of that and suddenly you've got $12 billion, we could capitalize an infrastructure bank. All of these things are possible if we get away from the notion of continuing to help the oil industry. The wealthiest industry in the world doesn't need our tax money as a subsidy, and we ought to reel that money back in and use it for things that really create investments in America. There are other ways we could do this. We had uh, what are called uh, bonds, uh, Build America bonds. Uh, those have expired, but those were extraordinarily uh, useful for, for small cities, big cities, uh, and counties to build infrastructure. Uh, many, many things that could be done, but unfortunately, we are now 12, 14 months into the current uh, control of the House by our Republicans, and not one of these things have come to the floor to rebuild the American economy. Um, we have work to do, and we can do it. I want to uh, just point out that the uh, Democratic uh, caucus, our colleagues on the Democratic side, have introduced 36 Make It in America bills different kinds of ways to do it. My two bills deal with our tax money for transportation, the gasoline tax, use it to buy American-made steel equipment, buses. And the other one I have is uh, using our tax money if we're going to subsidize um, wind turbines and solar cells, we buy American-made. And this is a way of keeping the jobs in America. I know you have some additional thoughts on this, and uh, let's continue on. Well, it is one of the very real problems we are facing in terms of building it in America. We are in the process of constructing a wind energy industry in the United States. It's been remarkably successful over the course of the last 20 years. We've watched the price per kilowatt hour produced by wind drop dramatically. Drop dramatically. And at the same time, we are watching these wind turbine farms. Uh, you have them in California. We have them in the Pacific Northwest. They're in the Midwest. They're in Texas. Um, They're providing revenue to rural America. Farmers and ranchers are being able to harvest the wind literally. With, with the cows and sheep beneath the turbines. At the same time, uh, this is low carbon. This is not com adding to our greenhouse gas effect. Uh, it's not something that is being exported overseas, giving money to people who don't like us very much. Uh, at the same time, uh, it is building this infrastructure. People who are now manufacturing wind turbines in the United States. People who are putting up uh, fabricating these towers, people dealing with the transmission capacity. But I will say that one of the things this Congress should do uh, is to extend the production tax credit. We've talked about benefits that flow to the oil industry. 
long past time that they were necessary to provide incentives for them to develop oil resources. But we have provided a little bit of an incentive to help get the wind energy business competitive. Well, that production tax credit expires at the end of the year. And already we are watching investment patterns start to pull back because people are uncertain that they can go ahead with large-scale projects investing millions, tens of millions of dollars, not certain that they will continue to have this tax benefit. That's outrageous. Of the $4 trillion of tax provisions that are going to expire at the end of the year, the opportunity for us to actually have deficit savings by recalibrating some of those, at a minimum, we ought to step up and we ought to step up now to be clear that the production tax credit is in fact going to continue so we don't shut down the wind energy industry. We don't lose the manufacturing and the construction to say nothing of clean renewable energy. That would be a tragedy. We have bipartisan legislation I've introduced with my friend from Seattle, Congressman Riker. We have uh, a number of very distinguished co-sponsors, including yourself. <laughs> um, this is something that shouldn't be languishing. There's a bipartisan interest in making sure that the wind energy industry doesn't shut down and that we continue making it in America. Thank you very, very much for bringing that issue up. It's one that is extremely important in my district because I do have uh, the two major Northern California wind farms in my district, one in the, the uh, Solano County area and the other one in the Altamont Pass area. Uh, my own uh, history in this goes back to 1978 when I authored the first state law to provide a tax reduction for those, a tax credit for those companies that built the wind turbines way back in 1978. Uh, so we've come a long, long way on this and we ought to get it going. I notice that you're going to have to go and I'm going to wrap up uh, shortly after you leave. We've gone through a lot of things here. I'm going to uh, just bring one more issue and that has to do with the price of fuel in America today. Thank you so very much, Thank my you. colleague from Oregon, uh, bringing us from the Northwest perspective on this. Um, there's a, I know, I went out and purchased gasoline this last week when I was back in California, and it was uh, something around the range of uh, $4.15 in one station, another $4.25. So what's going on here? Why, is, why are we seeing this sudden rise when, in fact, in the Midwest of the United States, uh, there is actually a surplus of oil? What's happening here? Well, I think we can look to several different things that are taking place. One thing we know is taking place is speculation. Uh, because of the Dodd-Frank legislation, the uh, government now has the power to deal with speculators. And I know the president picked this issue up when he was in Florida last week and said that this is something that a uh, special task force has been set up in the Department of Justice to uh, ferret out uh, the speculation that's taking place in the gasoline markets. Uh, I also said uh, I had heard a rumor that the United States is actually exporting gasoline. Uh, and in fact, we are. We're exporting over 26 million gallons of gasoline a day. Yeah, you heard that right. We are exporting over 26 million gallons of gasoline a day. And the energy companies say, well, the price is going up because of a shortage of gasoline. Huh? What? Are you selling me? There's a shortage when we're actually exporting gasoline? Why are we doing that? Oh, we do import gasoline too. But your imports are balanced by exports. So how does that help America? I don't think it does. Speculation, the export of gasoline, and you wonder why the prices are going up? Well, certainly the uh, speculation has to do with the question of Iran and whether we're going to shut down the Straits of Hormuz or not. Well, that's speculation. But the reality today is there's a glut of oil in the Midwest that ought to be used for refining gasoline and diesel in the United States. We ought to make it in the United States and keep it in the United States. 26 million gallons a day being exported. 
We'd like to have that in California. We'd like to have that drive down the price in California. There's not a shortage. There may be a shortage of wisdom. There may be an excess of market-driven policies here. But we have a crisis in the United States, and it's certainly the price of gasoline. A lot of discussion about drill, baby, drill. Okay, let's understand that in the, we are now drilling and producing more oil in the United States this year than in the previous eight years. That's right, right back to the Republican administration when George W. Bush was in power and the Republicans controlled both houses. The drilling of oil was at an all-time low. As we've come into this period of time, we've seen the production increase to the highest it's been in the last eight years, and more to come. But the opening of the Outer Continental Shelf, the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge, and others will have nothing to do with the near term, that is, in the next five to ten years, because of the length of time it takes to produce from those new areas. And by the way, you don't need to waive every environmental law in the, in the nation or in the state to go to get that oil off the coast of California with directional drilling. You don't even know. You don't even need to get onto the ocean to get to the oil. You can drill from the land, reducing the risk to the environment, to, near, to the marine environment, to near zero, and access oil that's six miles offshore. We ought to be looking at those things. And one other thing, and I think I will wrap with this, and so my Republican colleagues, if they need a little time to get here uh, for their next hour, here's fair warning. Um, natural gas, an extraordinary asset for America. Natural gas is readily available. We're producing more natural gas in America now than ever before, and we're discovering that we can get even more. We're looking at an extraordinary asset. This is an American asset. It is a strategic asset. It is leading to the creation of jobs in America right now. In my own district that I share with uh, Representative George Miller, we have seen the Dow Chemical Plant in Pittsburgh and on the, on the uh, line, the Antioch line, uh, city line boundary, we're seeing Dow Chemical coming home, bringing jobs back to America investing a large sum of money, millions and millions of dollars, in that facility because of the low price on natural gas. All across this winter, in every part of America, we've seen homeowners' heating bills not soar, but actually decline. Yes, it's been a warm winter, but the price of natural gas for heating in the uh, Atlantic, in the North Atlantic states, uh, the New England states, and across the Midwest, and even in California, the price of natural gas is at an all-time low. Average last year was $4.30, when just five years before, uh, it was in the 12 10 to $12 range. So we're seeing an incredible opportunity for America. Energy is the foundation, the foundation of our economy. And when you have a ready, a ready supply in abundance, you ought to recognize that as a strategic asset. And yet, in committee after committee, in my own Natural Resources Committee, I've seen my Republican colleagues put forth bills that would export natural gas. Take this strategic asset and send it overseas because the energy companies can get a higher price overseas. They don't need a higher price. They're doing quite well, thank you. What we need is a reliable, low-cost energy source in America. Do not allow, do not allow by legislation or by executive order the export of natural gas from the United States. There's a little bit that now goes to Canada or to Mexico under the NAFTA agreements, all of that in pipeline. But just this last week, one of the big Wall Street uh, hedge funds decided to invest $2 billion in a Texas scheme to build an, a liquefied natural gas export facility. 
Well, I suppose it's nice to build it, but by golly, that's America's strategic asset that's going to be sent overseas. Be aware of what's happening here. You send that gas overseas in any large quantity, you're going to drive up the price of natural gas in America. So American farmers are going to pay more for their fertilizers. We're going to see home heating prices throughout the nation rise as those exports of this strategic asset rises. We're going to see that Dow Chemical is going to make a different decision about whether to come back to America to take advantage of the low cost of natural gas or whether they're going to say, okay, America is so screwed up, it's taking its, one of its most basic strategic assets and selling it for the highest price. I think back on the story of Esau in the, in the Bible where he sold out his birthright for a, a bowl of porridge. We ought not do this. We need an energy supply in America that we do have available to us. So with that, if my Republican colleagues are anywhere nearby, they can claim their hour. But uh, we've gone through some very, very important things here. The Make It in America agenda, 36 Democratic bills that would build our economy, that would cause us to come back and rebuild our great manufacturing sector. It will happen. It's government policies that over the last 25 years have caused the American um, manufacturing base to erode. Policies such as tax breaks for American companies that would send their jobs offshore. We stopped nearly all of that before the Democrats lost power here in Congress. And we ask our Republicans to work with us on putting f into law these 36 bills that will cause us to rebuild the American middle class to reignite the American middle, to reignite the American dream and give the middle class the opportunity to engage in manufacturing. Mr. Speaker, with that, I yield back my remaining time. Gentleman yields back his time. The chair lays before the House the following personal request. Leave of absence requested for Mr. Jackson of Illinois for today. Without objection, the request is granted. Chair lays before the House the following message. To the Congress of the United States, attached is the text of a presidential policy directive establishing procedures to implement Section 1022 of the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2012, Public Law 112-81, the Act which I hereby submit to the Congress as required under Section 1022C1 of the Act. The directive also includes a written certification that it is in the national security interests of the United States to waive the requirements of Section 1022A1 of the Act with respect to certain categories of individuals, which I hereby submit to the Congress in accordance with Section 1022A4 of the Act. Signed, Barack Obama, the White House. was referred to the Committee on Armed Services and ordered printed. All right, under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Bishop, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. I thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm coming tonight to talk about one of the issues that is of extreme significance. In fact, in every town hall meeting I've ever held, one of the first questions, if not the first question is asked, is about illegal entry into this country and specifically border security. So, in talking about what the issue is before us, this is a map of the United States that is divided into the border patrol sectors, the areas in which the border patrol has, and as you will see if you can from the numbers, there is a vast difference in the number of people who are coming illegally into this country based on the sector. If you go to the state of Maine, that sector, uh, the last time we had verifiable figures, the last time we had a complete, uh, complete figures from the Border Patrol and the Department of Homeland Security, only 56 illegals were apprehended trying to get into Maine, which has to tell you that there's not a whole lot of people from Nova Scotia trying to come over here and taking hockey jobs. In fact, I have to think they probably looked at them as tourists. But if you look down here in the area in blue, the Tucson, Arizona sector, which is only part of Arizona, it's not the entire state of Arizona, 51%, a quarter of a million people 
the last two years for which we have complete data, a quarter million people came through Arizona. In fact, 51 percent of all of the people who illegally came into the United States and were apprehended came through the Tucson, Arizona sector and were apprehended in the Tucson, Arizona sector, which has to bring about the simple question of why. Why is Arizona, this, this part of Arizona, the obvious entrance of choice of those trying to get into this country illegally? And I really think the answer lies in the next chart. This is the borderland along our southern border. The black line is 100 miles from the border, which is, by definition, both by statute and judicial decision, the legal jurisdiction of our border patrol. The area in red is the area that is owned by the federal government in those areas. You'll see that that specific area of Arizona, almost 80 percent of that is owned by the federal government. That's over 20, almost 21 million acres of land owned by the federal government, in sharp contrast to like the Texas border and especially the northern border. Of that 21 million acres, roughly 21 million acres, an area the size of the state of Connecticut and Delaware combined is wilderness area. And that doesn't include also areas that are endangered species habitat. Those areas that are red are where we find the federal government prohibiting the Border Patrol from doing its job. The Border Patrol actually has access in the white areas, private property, to do their job. It is only when the federal government stops the federal Border Patrol from doing their job on federal property that we seem to have a problem. And unfortunately, those coming into the country seem to realize that this area where the federal government stops the federal border patrol on federal land, as unusual and tr as bizarre as that seems, becomes the entrance of choice for them coming into this country. And I'm not just talking about immigrants, people coming over here to try and find jobs in some particular way. This is the entrance of choice of the drug cartels. Border Patrol will tell you privately their best estimate, only an estimate, is that 40 percent of those coming into this area of Arizona, in fact, in the country, are part of the drug cartel. They don't care if the economy is going up and down. They don't care if there is E-Verify or not. They are still trying to come into this country. They will tell you roughly 80 percent of the illegal drugs coming into this country are still coming by the drug cartel in this area. And what is worse, it is not just the drug cartel. This is also the kind of human degradation that is taking place. There's a Seattle Times story that ran in 2009, and the title was Pair Accused of Smuggling and Enslaving Illegal Mexican Immigrants. The story was about the human trafficking we have that is a, is a very serious problem and the kind of violent acts that are used against women and children on this federal property. Seattle Time went on to illustrate the kinds of violent acts against humanity that are happening right here on American soil. The kinds of numerous accounts of rape and other violent acts that are taking place against women and children here. The counties, and I have been down there on the border and have seen evidence of this, have ample evidence if you go along these trafficking routes of rate, rape trees in which the drug cartel members, sometimes other illegal immigrants, will rape females and then force the victim to leave an article of clothing, usually an undergarment on the trees, and make this as if it is a type of monument to the horrible activity that is taking place on government land. And yet still, we do not, do not give the Border Patrol access on government land that they have on private property. We are a sovereign country, and by definition, a sovereign country controls its borders. And that should be what we are doing. But unfortunately, we are not doing that at all. This is what the border down there in Arizona will look like from the air. You see, going along here is a fence. The fence doesn't go all the way up the mountainside. There are some areas in which fencing does not make sense and cannot be done. And there is one road that goes along the fence. That is the access that our Border Patrol has in this particular area. And in some cases, that becomes the sole access. If you talk to the Border Patrol agents on their, by themselves, when they will be honest with you, they will clearly tell you they don't need more money to fight this problem on the border. They don't necessarily need more personnel. What they need is access. 
east-west access so they can go somewhere other than along the one road that follows the border line and the border fence. That is what becomes extremely significant. And what is so bizarre, what is so bizarre in that is that the Border Patrol must obtain permission or a permit from federal land management agencies before its agents can maintain roads or install surveillance equipment on the lands or do what we ask them to do. And that, frank, frankly, is simply wrong and, once again, ludicrous. Now, you see, it's one of those odd things that we stop the Border Patrol from doing their job and instead, we find that environmental degradation is taking place, but not by the Border Patrol, not by any other American citizens, but by those who are illegally coming across. This simply is one of the pictures of the kinds of trash that is left behind on private property and on public property, tons of which must be picked up resulting from the fact that we do not have a Border Patrol that does have ability to, to patrol these particular areas. That's what's left behind. I hate to say this, but the drug cartel who is coming over doesn't care about wilderness designation. They don't care about endangered species habitat. They don't care about the endangered species unless it can be eaten. What they do is simply leave behind all of the trash as they're coming through. There is something wrong with that. This is another picture of what takes place there on the border. The cactus, this time the cacti along the border, is an endangered species that has been cut down by the drug cartels. If any other American did that, that becomes a felony. For them, all this is is a nice roadblock around one, along one of the few roads that is there, so when somebody else comes down there in a vehicle and stops, they are a perfect target for mugging and robbery and anything they want to. You'll find some of the cacti that's down there has graffiti on it, which shows certain areas where the cartel is in operations. Last, last couple of years, there have been some major fires down there along the southern border. The last large fire that went through Arizona and spilled over into New Mexico was a fire that started in two parts. The part up in northern Arizona probably was started by a camper. But in southern Arizona, uh, that wasn't it. Forest Service has yet to determine who started that fire that spilled over into New Mexico and cost hundreds of millions of dollars of damage. But they have ruled out everyone except, well, illegal aliens that happen to be close to the known smuggling trails where the fire actually started. You see, what happens down there is there are three types of fires that are started, two of them on purpose. One is a distress fire, in which case if somebody coming across the border is, is in a dire situation, lost their ability to go any further and they need rescuing, you start a fire because then obviously the firefighters will come and you'll get rescued. There is also diversion fires started specifically. A diversion fire is to make sure that when the fire starts over here and everyone runs over there to stop the fire, it means over here is now open for your diversion into this country. The drug cartels have this down to a habit and a style all of their own. The third part is simply an accidental fire. I think the assumption is that the last fires that were done down there were probably accidental fires, started indeed by those coming across the border illegally, but definitely not for diversion and not for distraction, just it was a problem that caused us enormous amount of public loss of public wealth and public time in trying to fix that particular problem. The Department of Interior simply claims that the 1964 uh, Wilderness Act takes precedence over everything else that is taking place on this property. They say that, this, that their duties are to fulfill this particular act, not necessarily to control the border. In fact, one of the letters they sent reads very carefully. The issue of emergency vehicle access by the U.S. Customs and Border Protection on the San Bernardino um, Wilderness Area, actually it doesn't say that, it says, issues remain and we seek your, the Border Patrol's assistance in resolving them as quickly as possible in order to prevent the significant and perhaps irreparable environmental damage we believe is imminent. Specifically, we are concerned with operating vehicles anywhere other than the roads, road dragging, and other activities that could cause erosion and mobile 
uh, and, and mobilize fragile hydraulic soil characteristics of the San Bernardino area. What that says in simple terms is it doesn't really matter what the, what the Border Patrol does. You don't want them to disturb the soil even if it means being able to apprehend somebody illegal, especially the drug cartels coming over there. They would rather have the soil not bothered than actually find somebody who is entering this country illegally, especially part of the drug cartel. This is where I started. This is a response, once again, from the Department of Interior to, uh, to the Border Patrol on this area. The issue of emergency vehicle access by the U.S. Customs and Border Protection on the San Bernardino Wildlife Refuge has been in dispute over the past few months. The recent exchange of letters from our respective offices failed to clearly identify the needs of our two agencies and reach agreement on how to best proceed. Now, once again, from my point of view, the way to best proceed is to stop the, drugs, the drug cartels from smuggling illegal drugs over here, not necessarily what took place. In fact, what they decided then was what it says is the federal land managers believe it is their duty to enforce restrictive laws associated with the Wilderness Act, even if it helps the drug cartel in their, human, in their drug trafficking and the human smuggling and other criminal activities that are, that are occurring as they cross into the United States. The chief also went on to say emergency circumstances exist. That's nice of them when human life, health, and safety of persons within this area must be immediately addressed. Access to the refuge by the Border Patrol will be limited to the use of established administrative roads. However, you may access on foot to patrol or apprehend suspects. Managers of the land are dictating to the Border Patrol how they will do their job. I might add that this definition of what considers the chance of a Border Patrol actually going in and doing something rapidly is not what the memo of understanding between the Department of Interior and the Department of Homeland Security actually said. They came up with their own definition to stop the Border Patrol from doing it. Now, under this recommendation, the Border Patrol has to drive around this refuge, which adds hours to get to the other side, which obviously, if you're trying to capture somebody, something that just doesn't work. So, since that's what's taking place, how does the Department of Interior decide to solve the problem? It's easy. They put up gates. That was the result of that exchange on how to solve the problem of controlling our southern border. What the Department of Interior simply did is they put up a gate with a lock on it on the San Bernardino National Wildlife Refuge. <laughs> it's amazing that they thought this solves the problem because what this gate does is lock out the Border Patrol from going in this area. It doesn't lock out anyone else, doesn't lock out the drug cartel, the human traffickers, or anyone else from trying to come in to this particular area. Early on, when uh, Janet Napolitano became head of the Homeland Security, we received a couple of letters from her. They actually said what the issue was down there on the border with the Border Patrol. She wrote, one issue affecting the efficacy of the Border Patrol operations within wilderness is prohibitions against mechanical conveyance, that's like four-wheelers, or, or in the air. The U.S. Border Patrol regularly depends on these conveyances the removal of such an advantage being generally detrimental to its ability to accomplish the national security mission. In simple language, if you stop us from going on motorized vehicles into these areas, we can't catch the bad guys. This includes that these types of restrictions can impact the efficacy of operations and be a hindrance to the maintenance of officer safety. It makes their job more difficult and it puts them at risk. For example, she continued, it may be inadvisable for officer safety to wait for the arrival of horses for pursuit purposes or to attempt to apprehend smuggling vehicles within the wilderness with a less capable form of transportation. In simple words again, 
if the idea is of Department of Interior that the Border Patrol, when they come to one of these special areas, have to go on foot, they have to chase them down on foot, or wait till a horse arrives so they can chase them down on horse, while the drug cartel are using motorized vehicles, that flat out does not make sense. But that is indeed what is happening down there. She continued on with a different com correspondence. It illustrates that in areas where the Border Patrol has been given access, the regrowth and rehabilitation of the land has improved. But overall, the removal of cross-border violators, stopping the drug cartel from coming across the border from public lands, is a value to the environment as well as to the mission of the land managers. The validity of this statement was evidenced recently when the vehicle fence pr project south of the Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge received praise from a fish and wildlife biologist. The biologist was encouraged by the regrowth and the rehabilitation taking place naturally to the north of the vehicle fence subsequent to its installation. Now, what she was saying very simply is when you stop the Border Patrol from being able to do their job, they don't do their job, and the bad guys come across. And the bad guys don't care at all about the environment or what the laws are or what the rules are. And if you are able to stop them, then all the degradation that takes place by the drug cartel coming across the border can be fixed and can be fixed well. Now, I have to admit that was early on in her administration with the Department of Homeland Security. I have to admit also of late, the Department of Homeland Security has been told to simply tell us Everything is going fine down there on the border. Things are getting better. We are working together nicely. It's not quite the same story I got on the trips down there to the border when I talked to the people. In fact, one of the things that is, that is, that is actually disturbing is our committee staff has been refused access to even talk to Department of Homeland Security personnel ever since we started making this particular kind of push. My assumption is there is a reason that the drug cartels are trying to go through this Arizona sector. The reason relates to the kinds of lands that are down there and how we treat those lands. And the reason simply says if we allow the Border Patrol to do their job, we will all be much more secure. And the concept of stopping the Border Patrol from doing their job on federal property is simply unacceptable. And yet, that is indeed what we are doing right now. To the uh, Department of Interior's response to that, they said the following in a memo, 2008. Congress has directed construction of these facilities, meaning the public lands, and there is a compelling national security issue, but these towers and buildings and associated equipment and motorized activities within congressionally designated wilderness would be contrary to protecting the primeval character of wilderness and hence contrary to the intent of Congress. Contrary to the intent of Congress? Do they really want us to believe that Congress wants to have a porous border? that Congress actually welcomes with opening arms the drug cartels coming into this country, that the illegal drugs coming in here that are destroying the lives of our children, we welcome with open arms, that the kind of human degradation, the kind of victim crimes, crimes against humanity, the kinds of rape trees are something Congress really wants to perpetuate. That's really what they want us to say. Further, further on with this memo, the Department of Homeland Security, Proposals would not preserve natural conditions. This is once again Interior's memo. Would make the imprint of man's work substantially, no substantially noticeable and would substantially reduce opportunities for solitude or a primitive and unconfined type of recreation and would impair these areas for their future use and enjoyment of the American people as wilderness. The DHS proposals do not fall under the exemptions of the prohibitions for use in Section 4C of the Wilderness Act and therefore are prohibited. Reduce opportunities for solitude, unconfined type of recreation. Maybe they do have a point. I'd say that the drug cartel operatives armed with AK-47s would pretty much reduce the solitude in a pretty serious way along the border. But unfortunately, that is the approach. That is the attitude. So, what does the Department of Interior propose for this?
rather than allowing the Border Patrol to do their job and trying to control our border, which a sovereign country would naturally do, you put up a sign to tell Americans that travel is not recommended. The goal is to stay away from these particular areas. The approach was simply this. Since the areas of American land on the American border are unsafe, let's do whatever we can to stop Americans from going down there. And in so doing, cede over these areas to the drug cartels. That will be one of the ways of solving the problems. Since that's not a terribly terribly politically correct approach to warn the public of the danger of traveling through American territory. Perhaps you can put up a softer and gentler sign, which is a travel caution. Smuggling and illegal immigration may be encountered in this area. Proceed at your own risk. I'm sorry, this may be the approach, but it's the wrong approach. And I wish this were just limited to the Arizona border. Same line was used in the Big Bend National Park and has been used on other federal lands, lands around the border. We simply know it is not safe to go into these areas where criminal activity is taking place, and the problem is no one is doing anything about it. Almost all of the Oregon Pipe National Monument was closed to visitors. That's along the Arizona border. Recently, I saw an article in which part, a portion, a portion of Oregon Pipe was opened up to visitors. That's wonderful. However, if you went there, you still had to go with an armed guard. There is an article that was written only eight hours ago talking about the opportunity of people going down there where the park ranger wearing a bulky, dark green, bulletproof vest told the tourists last week that they would be going on their, on their uh, travel in a van and a hike. He told them that there would be some law enforcement officers hiding in the hills and closing, closely watching their two-hour nature hike, while another pair of armed rangers would follow the tourists closely from the ground. They'll all have M14s at hand, he said. Please don't be worried. As the group loaded into the vans, one woman from Idaho whispered to her husband, does it make you worried? They got chest protections and we don't got none of them. Homeland Security has say, is saying that in this park, Things are getting better. I think they are. Because finally, they allowed Homeland Security to put up nine surveillance towers in the park, making it easier for the agents to detect new foot traffic so that drug runners are no longer simply hiding in the hills, waiting for them, waiting to succeed where the, where the towers cannot contact them. See, that's what we're doing. And that's simply not a viable approach to it. Let me try and give you the, to tell you this way. Obviously, a fence by itself is not enough to secure the border. We do need electronic tracking devices. This is a picture of one of our mobile tracking devices. It's very high tech, it's very wonderful, and as you'll notice, it's a truck with a traffic device on it. In the Oregon Pipe National Monument, they tried to move this from point A to point B. And the end result was that after, after six months, the land managers finally said, okay, you can move this truck from point A to point B. By that time, it wasn't worth it. It's a truck. Now, if the land manager had studied this issue for six months and then said, all right, look, the land is too precious in that part where you want to go, you can't go at all, maybe I could understand that. I wouldn't like it, but I could understand it. But that's not what he said. He said, you're going to wait six months, I'll review it for six months, and six months later he said, okay, Go ahead and take, go ahead and back up the truck and move it. These devices are essential for us controlling the border, but it is essential that if it is a mobile device, it has to be mobile. It has to have the ability of backing up the truck and moving it to somewhere else. There is another example of the pronghorn uh, antelope that is there, the Sonoran pronghorn antelope in the area. A BLM official wrote in an email to the Department of Homeland Security regarding testing for replacement of equipment that they could do the following. A biological monitor shall be pr pr present, a person shall be present at the proposed location of these traffic monitors for the Sonoran pronghorn prior to any disturbance. The monitor must have experience with observing pronghorns. The monitor will scan the area for pronghorn and if observed, 
Any kind of activity will be delayed until the pronghorn, pronghorn moved of its own volition. The pronghorn cannot be encouraged to vacate an area. And if by any chance the Border Patrol was to run across a group of these, its job was then to back up, not turn around, but to back up no faster than 15 miles an hour until you were out of that particular area. One of the things that we have found out that is taking place down there is basically Department of Interior is insisting on mitigation. I think there's some other words that I would rather use, mitigation funds coming from the Department of Homeland Security. Conducting a, the calculations we conducted a couple of years ago says that as of that date, $10 million of federal money has gone to the Border Patrol supposedly to protect our border and then, been, and then instead been reverted over to the Department of Interior to hire things like the pronghorn monitor or buy other property for other purposes in the name of mitigation of the environmental damage caused by the Border Patrol. Unfortunately, there is no way to, to mitigate against the environmental da damage caused by the drug cartels and the human smugglers coming in here, nor does the Department of Interior seem to care about that. You ready? I'm joined here by uh, a good friend from Arizona who knows this full well. This is where he lives and understands it. He also sits on the committee that talks about these particular areas and has introduced a piece of an amendment on their reauthorization bill that comes from his committee. So the representative, Mr. Quayle, I will yield to him what time he needs if he'd like to enter right now, and then I'll pick it up when